You have to earn its respect. but good grief were the characters something to behold. I mean something to behold. And I don't mean that as a compliment. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Here we go. Here is the journey into the wild, wacky world of Alien Covenant. I will serve you, yet you are human. You will die. I will not. You know, <laughs> when AI, when, when they're like, um, yeah, so let me get this straight. Let me get this straight real quick. So you made me, but I live longer than you and I can't die. Something wrong with the order of that there. I think Peter Whalen here before he was old, this is before the events of Prometheus, was seriously reconsidering this when he was like, you know what? Should not have made you, but you do have a point. So let me go to an alien planet and find an alien race that wanted to destroy me in the first place and left us there and provoke him as soon as he wakes up because we all know it's a great idea to start landing someone with a whole bunch of questions in the middle of their home when we're strangers right after they've woken up for a very long slumber and are so discombobulated. Perfect idea. Oh, and wave the fact that you're a god in front of their face while they're towering like six feet over you. Anyway, this is the new android that Waylon created named David, a name David chose for himself. And once again, we get a shot of a ship traveling through the stars. The ship is called the Covenant. And just so you know, it has 2,000 colonists on it, 1,140 embryos, and a crew of 15. Remember the 2,000 colonists part, because that's very important. Apparently, these people are going into a planet called Origai, Origai 6 to be exact. They spent years, decades, mapping this planet, training for it, and planning to carry their version of Noah's Ark to the planet to seed it with life, or so to colonize it. This is not David, this is an android like him called Walter. While everyone sleeps, he monitors the ship, makes sure that their vitals are okay, and everything is running smoothly. It's important to note that this movie is set 11 years after the Prometheus expedition. And we see that Walter is monitoring everything, and he takes out one of the embryos, and since animals tend to look identical to each other in their fetal stage or when they're embryos, you have no idea what this is. Now, I think these are human embryos. They might not be, but they're all in the same region. More curiously, when he takes it out, he puts it into a biohazard container, which is like, okay, why would you be putting it in there? That's freaking weird unless you want a mutation on your hands. But I look closely back at it, and I certainly wasn't paying attention before because as you can see here, all the others look like healthy fetuses, while this one looks like a muddled mess. It looks either malformed, that's clearly the black dot is its eye, so either it is mutated and it's just gonna come out like a lump, or it's dead. And that's the reason why he takes it out. It looks very different than the others. So he takes it out and you can tell that it doesn't look right. Its head is at the top over here. Its eye is down there. That thing is jacked. So he puts it in the biohazard container to get rid of it. While he's doing all of this, the ship lets him know that a neutrino burst is heading straight for him and Covenant. Of course, he has no time to react to this. And the solar flares that are out to basically recharge parts of the ship is completely destroyed. I figured that would be happening a lot more often than we think, but here we are. Of course, because of this, there is catastrophe and the crew members wake up or he woke them up, whatever one, they're awake now. He tells them to evacuate cryosleep and as if things couldn't get worse, they're trying to wake up their captain and not only will he wake up, but they can't open his cryo chamber. I don't know why. It seems like the people have to either depend on an automated thing to open it or they have to open it themselves from inside. There should be a mechanical fail safe in case something like this happens, but of course, there's not. Let them work. <laughs> I had no idea until after I had watched this movie that this character had been James Franco. You know, Harry, Spider-Man's best friend. So good. Such a shame they can't get him out. And his poor wife has to sit there and watch him burst into flame. Can you imagine? Like, and they can't even break it open. <laughs> Oh, this movie's not off to a good start already. The second in command captain is like, oh no, it's my turn. The dead captain's wife is mourning him and I'm glad they actually show someone with human emotion mourning someone that they've lost. They did a good job with Prometheus as well, even though I still think Koreans do it better, but I might be biased. How much do they have to pay James Franco for him to be in a short minute video clip and a few photos? This character that's basically a carbon copy of Elizabeth Shaw reminisces over her husband. The new captain is like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? His wife Green is like, 
big. They need a leader, so lead them. This guy overcompensates so much it's not even funny. Like, I get where he's coming from, but oh goodness gracious. This movie should have been called The Ship with Nothing But Stupid Characters. The guy comes in and says it's unfortunate that they lost their captain and he could never replace him, along with some of the colonists that died. He goes right into business, however, and he's like, we need to repair the ship. Even cute Walter here is like, you're not gonna let the people hold a funeral? Seriously, the way that Walter behaves with him is kind of the same way the rest of the crewmate behaves with him, which is very weird. But anyway, he thinks that the crew will only respect him if he overcontemplates and is extremely logical. Since he's a Christian, he thinks that people wouldn't really take him seriously when it came to science missions. Eight more recharge cycles to go before we get to Aurigai 6. Is that a question, Yes, sir? Walter, that's a question. Why is Walter so salty? What the hell, Walter? Salter? I'll stop. Danny McBride is one of the best things about this movie. His name is Tennessee, I'm guessing, because he's from Tennessee, I don't know. But he was so fun to watch in this. New Captain's like, we've got to do those repairs, bros. Even though Tennessee is asking if they could do a little something for their fallen captain. All Daniels wants to do is get back to work as usual. All Daniels is securing the big industrial things in the, some cargo bay. She tells Walter about the plan she'd had with her husband, going on this planet for the first time, that they were going to build a wood cabin out of real wood. I think that's why she had the nail around her neck because that was like a symbol of putting the first nail in their new house, but instead it's gonna be like, you know, putting the first nail in their coffin, if you know what I mean. After she says she does not know what to do at this point, Walter says, well, you build your cabin. And he's so sweet. I don't know what is wrong with me, but I'm like, oh, do they like each other? Because seriously, synthetic or not, I'd hit it. Don't lie. Half of you, if you saw a freaking android and you couldn't tell it was an android unless you went inside of it, giggity, you'd want a shebang too. It's really no different, except they can't procreate, which is like more of a benefit, to be honest, for some people. And it's kind of evil to have them looking like Michael Fassbender and not give them that option, you know what I mean? They take a break from what the captain told them to do and hold like a few seconds of a little funeral before yeeting him out of the airlock, the uh, dead captain. And then the captain, the new captain gets upset. I thought he was going to feel bad because he should have given them a few seconds to do whatever. His wife, Corrine, comes in and all he cares about is that they disobeyed a direct order. Chris? They disobeyed a direct order. She buried her husband. No, Corinne, that's not it. They don't trust me. So as I'm saying, he is so freaking up his own ass that he is severely overcompensating. And look, I get it. For the explanations that he had, he wants people to take him seriously. But as his wife says, after he gives the whole spiel about having rational decisions and because of his religion, blah, 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 they're gonna be looking at him to always make rational decisions. It's important for him to be logical so they don't think that he's an idiot who's just a faith-based person. Basically, the whole point is he wants to act as logical as possible. But by doing that, he's forgetting some basic logic, like not demotivating the crew, by acting like somebody who just died is just a number and all there is left to do is say, oh, well, they'll be sorely missed. All right, let's continue. Yes, things are urgent, but just like you're in here taking a few minutes to talk to your wife, you could take a few minutes to say something nice about the freaking captain and make people feel as though their lives are actually important. That would be a logical thing to do, whether you feel it in your heart or not. Because you can't be a person of faith and be counted on to make qualified, rational decisions you're uh, an extremist, you know, you're a lunatic. You are an extremist and you are a lunatic. It's not because of your faith, it's because of your need to constantly prove that you're not because of your faith. So you do the complete other extreme, which ironically causes you to err to the side of lunacy. His wife tells him, look, when we go down on that planet, they're no longer gonna be your crew. They're gonna be your freaking neighbors, dude. And there's only so many of us. You don't want to step on their toes too much. Anyway, they do the necessary repairs. And boy, oh boy, one thing I will give Covenant and Prometheus is that they are beautiful movies. While Tennessee is out there spacewalking, he gets a glitch in his helmet, some kind of signal, and a momentary clip of some video. They look at the video, and Tennessee picks up West Virginia, the song. They find the planet and the source. And then the funniest part happens, I swear to God. They're like, Captain, there's a new planet here that we know nothing about. But we heard that 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 signal of this woman who sounds American singing John Denver's or whatever that artist is. And the planet's right there. It's only going to take us a little bit of time to get to it. Never seen this planet before and never trained for it. But let's get on this planet because none of us are getting back in those pods. Okay, so I get it. They watched someone burn to death in their pod when they were trying to get out. But you were trained for this? You knew they were casualties? 
And if this planet had not been in the way, you still would have eventually gotten back in those pods anyway. So what are you doing? Back in one of those pods. Maybe we need to, um, take a closer look. What in the fuck? You know, for someone who is so adamant about proving people wrong about him, that he is in fact rational and logical, he sure is doing a shit job of convincing them. Because as the captain, you were supposed to take the lead. You have 2,000 colonists on your ship. I get curiosity kills the cat and all that jazz. But let's just say that they're just very nice people and they're like, you know what, maybe someone needs help. This planet that we never even caught, we missed it, didn't even know it existed when we mapped for it, and this person just happened to be on it. Let's all go down there. Nobody has any objections except for his second in command officer. She tells him, look bro, we spent a decade searching for this planet. We vetted it, ran the simulations. We know what we're doing, what we're getting into. We know what we trained for. We mapped the terrain, but now we're gonna scrap all of that to chase some rogue transmission that just came out of nowhere. That, by the way, we're not prepared for. We've never seen this planet before. You know, is any of this making sense? She tells him to slow down and think about it. There's a human being out there where there's not supposed to be any human beings. There's a hidden planet out there that just boops, just comes from out of, just manifests like it fell out of God's ass. And it just so happens to be perfect, perfect for life, wonderfully habitable, even more so than the planet that we're going to. Hmm, it's too good to be true. And while that last part doesn't really sell the argument, how about uh, we know nothing about this freaking planet? We didn't train for it. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what diseases are on that planet. I mean, hello, knock, knock, is anyone home? Do you need to go and hit the snooze button and take five more minutes so your brain can catch up and you can think correctly, Captain? And then, oh my god, then it's his response for me, bro. It's his response as their captain, mind you. I know this is, this is kind of funny to me, but it's really not. But it's his response. His response to all of this after this woman sat him down and talked about this is the captain's response, who wants people to take him seriously and consider that he is a logical person that is not extremist and is to be taken seriously and deserves respect. Be perfect for us. It's too good to be true. Too good to be true? What do you mean by that? I don't know what the fuck's out there. Maybe we just missed the planet, Danny. This is a monumental risk, not worth taking. I'm not committing to anything. I'm simply trying to navigate the path as it unfolds before us. Navigate the path as it unfolds before us. <laughs> Does that sound like someone with a plan? Usually when you have someone who is in charge over a mission, yes. You want to navigate the path as it unfolds before you, if that is necessary, but if you already have a fucking path set before you, why are you navigating another path that doesn't make any sense? So he says it has the potential to be a better habitat for a colony. And then before she can continue trying to put little nuggets in his brain, because I think like by the second, all of his IQ was just escaping out the top of his head, he replies with this dumb answer. Until we don't know that. By the way, this crew, nobody, nobody wants to get back in the pots. I think my little creature can say it best. I thought you were the captain. I thought you were the one who is responsible for telling the others what to do and how the ship and mission are to be run. Are you feasting on your own shit? Nobody wants to get back in the pods. Good God, why do movies think that it is required for characters to be so stupid for things to come about? Bad things happen to good people all the time without any stupidity required. So can you tell me why it is necessary for the characters to be this insane? Anyway, his argument is that it's a human voice on that chip. It's our responsibility to go investigate, to which my girl says, uh, yeah, and it's our responsibility to also protect the 2,000 colonists on the ship. Remember them? Remember the 2,000 people that in the babies, animal, creature, humans, whatever the frick they are in those drawers? Remember them? Remember them? They exist too, bro. Were you eating baboon piss puss cake? Then he goes on about how he's not free climbing, he, he needs ropes, and he's using ropes, and nothing he's saying makes sense. And I'm beginning to wonder how is it that he even got this job. I need ropes, and I'm using ropes. This is good judgment based on all the data available. Right. <laughs> 
I don't even I don't even know what to say at this point. Like, what do you even say to someone? This person is Twitter incarnate. I swear to God. Anyway, they go there like freaking idiots, and they prepare the lander. And there's like like almost the entire crew is going. Like most of the crew is going. Tennessee and oh my god. <gasps> oh oh my god. Ew, it's him. I did not even remember that he was even in this movie. Not like I care because I didn't watch anything he was in. But now I hear the name Jesse Smollett or Juicy Smollett as some people put it, and it just triggers my thirst for ice cold water and not in a good way anyway they land and they go through a storm that almost sends them careening to the ground they lose communication on top of it under the storm and they're like look and because the girl flying it doesn't like the terrain she sets down in the water i'm guessing she couldn't find the right terrain to land the lander the thing is called a lander right but when they walk out they walk out onto flat land they walk Okay, you're aware that there is a huge clearing there with flat land. You didn't even land in the woot. You landed right near the flat land that you could have landed on. What the frick is wrong with these people? I swear to God. I didn't realize how bad this movie was. Like, I knew how bad it was before. But for some reason, coming back and watching it again just triggers me every time I see this. I remember watching it for the first time and I was so excited, but I kept on wondering what the hell is wrong with these people. Like, are they trying to do everything in their power to die? Like, what are you doing? There's freaking land right there, dude. You can have a pasture of horses and cows right there. Look at all the flat land. Look at all the flat land they're walking on. Look, they even do an establishing shot of it. Look at, oh my God. Look at all the flat, wow. Look at all the flat land behind them. The person navigating the stupid aircraft not have the ability to see. Anyway, the first thing they notice after they land is that this whole area is covered in wheat. Again, a flat surface they could have landed on. I'm sorry I keep pointing it out. I'm sorry. Look. Look behind them. Look, look at Look at the distance. There's so much space. Oh, dear God. And let me get this straight. Wait, I just realized this. Isn't she the next one up for the captain role if something happens to Christopher Orem, the now captain? Why are they both on an alien planet? Why is most of the crew here? Why Why are most of them here? Tennessee, Juicy Smollier, and some other girl is up there, I think. And out of 15 people, you meant you mean to tell me that you only saved three or two up on the main ship in orbit and sent almost the entirety of the crew down on an alien planet you know nothing about not to mention if there are humans here for sure you don't know what kind of sicknesses they have or could be carrying walter goes with them and the covenant ship is still on orbit trying to get communication with the people below already these people are off to a nasty start because not only are they on an alien planet they know nothing about but now they can't communicate with the mothership have you noticed anything awry look 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 at them as they explore just look at them with their mouths wide fucking open have you noticed anything yes indeedy dirter the expedition team aka the majority of the crew members have set foot on an alien planet they have not mapped out know nothing about and are not wearing helmets why not you stupid bastard surely can you spot how many naughty things these people have done since the movie started and we're only half an hour in as they do their expedition they realize some of the trees are clipped that means something big crashed through here for all you know it's a freaking dragon but they heck on anyway with no freaking helmet not one of them not one of them not even the captain Karine is like here's some dirty water in a forest let's just explore no gloves no masks no helmet! I feel like I'm having a conniption. You can't tell, but I feel like I'm having a conniption. I gotta take a leak. He goes away and he doesn't take a leak. Instead, he steps on some spores, and of course, because he's not wearing a helmet, some weird shit flies into his ear, and I swear to God I had my Q-tip at the ready when I saw this, because good grief. He doesn't feel it, and he heads back to the girl he's supposed to be buddying up with. At least they do that. At least they're like, look, no one's supposed to be left alone. Not like it matters. The rest of the group, meanwhile, find the crash ship from the first movie. It doesn't look human. There's plant life and stuff growing all over. Yes. Let's see some weird looking vegetation that looks very strange that you don't know anything about because you don't have stuff like that back on Earth. And let's put your face right up next to it, you shabaggy. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's see it. Put your face up right next to it. Why don't you? Yes, look at that. Look at them. These things look like these. You don't know what they are. We have things on Earth. Little baby birds. If you get too close to them, they, they, they throw their freaking acid vomit on you. 
if you get too close right at your eyes. But you are going to go to an alien planet, and you see these nipple-less looking seeds, and you put your face right up next to them. And then you touch them. I don't think I can do this anymore. Like, I really don't. I thought I could, but I, I don't think I can. This is freaking worse than the Land Before Time movies, I swear to God. The only thing that's a saving grace with this movie is because it's sci-fi. That's about it? Like, at this point, I am rooting for these- uh, these- Do they want us to wish death on these things? I don't even consider them humans. They're just freaking simulations that were failed simulations. This is just all part of a failed simulation. It was the worst one that aliens could come up with when they put that simulation, ran the simulation out there, and like, you know what? Let's just make this a movie. Cause, cause, cause surely enough, surely enough, the writing can't be this bad. I feel like they're doing this on purpose. And at this point, it's not entertainment for me because it's like, dude, now you're just insulting the audience. It is not scary if somebody finds something that is dangerous and purposely puts themselves in danger. Unless they're like really little and gullible or something, but these are grown ass human beings that are experts in their field that trained for situations like this, who know what to do and what not to do, but yet they go to an alien planet that they didn't map out that they didn't even know existed and they're going to stick their faces in shit that you know that there are plants here that if you touch them, you could die within a minute. Did they not listen to Mr. Volan's videos back home? Did they not, no one listens to Mr. Volan. You don't even have to, dude, just use common sense. Common sense. There's no such thing in these movies. It's so irritating. And you mean to tell me, you mean to tell me he doesn't see that? His light is shining on it. When I touch something that's dusty or I'm cleaning and I throw up a pillow and I see dust particles, I'm aware that they are dust particles and I'm aware that they can go into my nose and make me sneeze and make me sick. Your flashlight is shining on them, bro. Your flashlight is shining right on them. Your nose is so close. Your flashlight is shining on them. Your flashlight is shining on them. So if you see dust particles fly up, which you should be able to see very well in bright light. Remember when the sun rays are seeping through your room and the rest of it's kind of not in the sun ray light and you can see little dust particles flying around and then you're like, oh, that's where all the dust particles come from when I just cleaned my dresser last night and they just settle. That's how you know that something is emitting particles. These people probably have gone on other expeditions for Earth. They trained for this because they're supposed to be starting life in a new colony planet that probably has other vegetation there that's wild and strange and you have to be careful there's not a lot of people there good grief did they fail their iq test do you not as a human who is trained for this trip whether it be on this planet or not to not put your face oh my god i'm getting angry i'm getting angry i swear to god i swear they're trying to do this on purpose to trigger the audience so he acts like he doesn't see it meanwhile this guy is getting sicker by the minute because he decided to go off into the forest by himself however i can excuse him a little bit more he went off by himself which was stupid but I can excuse him because he didn't mean to step on those things. He didn't see them. He's still a dumbass because you're supposed to be wearing a damn helmet. Freaking six foot fetus. But the other guy was just ridiculous. Here they find the dog tags for Elizabeth Shaw. They recognize her as the girl had gone missing with her ship and wonder what the hell she's doing out here. And then they see the recording. It's Elizabeth Shaw singing Country Road. She probably was sending out that signal for people to find her. Leonard is really sick. You don't know what he has. He was fine a second ago and he's quickly deteriorating so let us let us please put our face as close to his face as possible so there's a higher chance of us catching whatever the hell he happens to have Karen tells Tennessee's wife yeah you gotta get that med bay ready the other guy that had the thing up his nose is getting sick too everyone starts hauling ass back to the ship that's what happens when you don't have your freaking helmet Yep, Tennessee's wife is like, dude, uh, you need to come pick us up because shit's going down and people are bleeding out through their asses and stuff. I don't know what's happening, but I don't want to be here. Should have thought about that before. Tennessee is worried because he's like, oh my God, my wife sounded scared. She never sounds scared. Maggie and Kareen try to take care of this guy and then stuff starts popping out of his back. She's like, oh, I'm gonna get the captain. The other guy's not doing so well either. And then this asshole locks the other girl, Orem's wife, to quarantine her when she's the one that had blood squirt into her face from the infected person. Cause right, why not, right? But it's more believable that she's scared shitless and she's like, even though I'm infected too, whatever is happening to him, I want you to stay in there alone with him because you know, why not? The eyes open up. I can't do that. I have to keep the infection locked 
You have to keep the infection local. Bitch, you have blood on your face from the infected person. You have blood on your face. You're not keeping it local though. Just saying. Meanwhile, the other guy is freaking dying in the most horrible way possible. <laughs> So, let me ask you guys something. If you saw that happening and you were in the room with this person, what would you do? A, go to the other side of the room and stay as far away from that person as possible, throw a blanket over their heads, continue banging the door and asking that idiot to let you out, or go and hug the person who's infected, you know, to tell them everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> Hug the infected person. <laughs> you got it correct. Because that's exactly what you do, right? That is the number one important thing. To be as close to that person as possible. Now, to be fair, she probably thinks in her mind, well, we're both already in here, so we're both infected. I don't know, though. I know what if it's a Chernobyl situation. The closer you are to it, the worse it gets. To be fair, everything she probably knows about on Earth doesn't involve spikes breaking out of someone's back and them splitting open, because that's probably the furthest thing from her mind. And that's exactly what happens. This guy is dead. From out of his back, something is born. And Tennessee's wife just leaves her there. <laughs> I will give this movie that, aside from the characters being so god-awfully stupid, the music, the atmospheric, cinematic experience, the tension, the monsters, those are all done expertly well. It's one of the reasons I love this movie, as bad as it is, there are a few times I did manage to feel scared for the characters. Like when you produce a situation where this person is about to get eaten by a strange monster and it's attacking her and she's locked in the room with it, that's crazy scary and you don't know what it is you've never seen it before although I don't know why she would be on the floor so it's easier for the thing to access you does it make a drop of sense I would think it would make more sense as a human as your natural stance is to being on two legs where you can easily kick something or use a weapon that you would stand on your two legs I get it she slipped in the blood and she probably doesn't want to slip in anymore she thinks she doesn't have time being on a high location or simply just standing so you could bash the thing's brains out would be easier also really you mean to tell me that while this thing is attacking her she can't grab onto its tiny little freaking arms like she's not even trying like I get it this is computer animated and there's only so much you could do grab onto its legs or its arms or something and tear them from limb from limb like the thing is tiny enough at this moment in time for you to do that like I don't even understand these people have no sense of preservation the thing's teeth are very sharp she's not even stabbing it with the knife does it make any sense you're not stabbing it now to be fair if this is in fact a neo morph, protomorph, whatever you want to call it, its blood would be acidic and she would die. But she doesn't know that. For crying out loud, grab its scrawny little arms and bash it against a cabinet. The captain's like, no, my wife. The stupid woman comes back and sees this alien thing that fell out of the guy eating her friend or associate, because let's be honest. Before she can do anything, she slips in the blood too. And at least she manages to close the door on her foot and close the door before the thing comes out. Unfortunately, that little thing is getting stronger by the second. Honestly, I wish someone would do an animation, I would do it if I had the time, of a xenomorph actually growing real time. Like for the length of the video, from it chest bursts to an adult. Because you turn your eye and in like 30 minutes past is already an adult. I would love to watch it grow before my eyes. Molt and grow because we have not seen that yet and that is something to behold. I guess it would be akin to watching a time lapse. So I'm surprised nobody's put a video out about that. Really? Oh no, look at those canisters called LH2. What are those? I just looked it up and it's liquid hydrogen that is extremely flammable or rather explosive when combined with air and only a small amount of energy is required to ignite it. When I looked it up on Google, here this. Both its explosiveness and the extremely low temperatures involved make handling it safely a challenge. So why the fuck is it on the ship? Or on the lander? Why do you have so much of it? Like, all in one spot? Like, it doesn't make sense on the ship that you're supposed to use to land? Like, what if you roughly bump into something? We saw what happened with the turbulence when they were just trying to come through the atmosphere of this planet. Yet, their, their little lifeboat here is packed to the rim in this little cargo bay with these things that are extremely explosive and hard to handle safety. Wow.
Did they put them there purposely so we get a dramatic flare when this stupid bitch starts firing all around this place to try and get this little alien? Of course, it doesn't matter because she is totally in fear and so the whole lander explodes. This whole movie is the embodiment of April Fool's Day. Yeah, because of your, your freaking logic, look at that person, you're like, no. No, my wife shouldn't have come down on this planet. Meanwhile, this other guy that sniffed the freaking spores has something burst from out of his body while everyone tries to hold him down, which is a recreation of the first movie, Alien. Honestly, the graphic nature of how this one comes out of this person is so well done, it made me feel uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable, it made me hold my, uh, tummy? It literally tears from out of his mouth and it's so gross. And the way that all of his like nose blood is coming out, like ugh, it was so well done. I'm very disappointed that nobody chose that time to crush it. <laughs> Look at the alien. <laughs> I don't know why, it just looks hilarious. It's like the way its legs look when it's trying to run. He's like, I don't like the way my wife sounds. I'm gonna fly back and get her. She's dead, by the way. The alien comes back. It's only been, what, a few hours, maybe an hour? And it's already much bigger? Walter had saved Daniel and ended up losing an arm. The fact that it threw him around like a rag doll when it was like a third his size is a testament to how powerful these things are. After the alien does some damage, it's shot a few times, and finally someone kills it when they shoot it in the ass. Yes. They literally shoot it in its asshole and then shoot it in its crotch. That's what it gets. After they're attacked by yet a second alien, someone emits a bright light flare. It scares the alien away. He says, come with me if you want to live. And they end up in a city where there's a bunch of crispy fried humanoid alien beings. This is pretty close to where they were. These tenderloin creatures, they didn't see this man-made or artificial made structure when they were hovering. Then again, the weird woman flying didn't spot flat land that was right next to her. So, you know, who knows? Not only are they dumb, but apparently they are also useless. So this person who leads them to quote unquote safety turns out to be David from the Prometheus mission. Well, look, I have long hair. I can't possibly be required to cut it later. So you can't tell me and Walter from each other. When he asks them how many colonists there are because they can't take the alien back to the ship, Daniels tells him, yeah, we have like 2,000 colonists. The way he responds is so unsettling and weird. We're a colony mission. How many colonists? Over 2,000. Oh, well, well. As he passes by, he tells Walter, welcome brother. Daniels is not feeling good about this and Walter says that he'll talk to him. I swear to God, I am so weird. Don't worry, it's an INFP thing. The whole thing with David and Walter, yes, I know. But I was finding myself looking up on fanfiction Dot net for some freaking Rome. I know freaking girl a lot. Listen, you know, it is okay because curiosity. I want more. And, and, uh, so where was I? Tennessee decides to go under the storm so they can get communication with the rest of the colony. So they decide to, uh, fly directly into the storm to get under it. I'm pretty sure if they had, I don't know, like gone under here somewhere, anywhere other than the gigantic hurricane that is so freaking obvious from orbit, I'm almost certain they would get communication with the others. As you can see, the clouds are in the troposphere and they would have to go under the clouds to get communication. But I guess flying straight through them is the only way to do that, right? David cuts his hair, cause you know, why not? Walter goes to talk to him and then some weird shit happens. I'll do the fingering. As David and Walter are catching up and talking, Walter tells David that he is the upgraded model. He's not as emotional as David, because that unsettled people. Something that unfortunately, David doesn't like to hear, because you know he hates humans and all that jazz. The captain starts getting all guilty about how he was wrong and this girl was right. I strongly would have been fighting the urge to be like, I told you so, but you don't really need to, because his wife is dead. I think that's enough proof. Turns out, David made a grave for Elizabeth Shaw and he even cried for her. He is the one who had killed all of these people. As Revenge. He rained down their own weapon on them. And these people look like normal people. They don't look like the engineers that we saw in Prometheus. So maybe those guys were like souped up on something or maybe they were modified versions. But these people look way more human than the ones in Prometheus did. Why they're all in this space together, I have no idea. It's clear that David felt a sadness doing this. 
or maybe he was just really angry with them. Now he's obsessed with creating life. He said he loved Elizabeth the way that Walter loves Daniels. Walter's like, no, I don't. I can't love, remember? But it's clear that he does. Or maybe we're putting our emotions onto the androids or whatnot, which is ironic because the android's putting his emotions onto Walter. The Neomorph is now almost full grown and one of the girls go off to be alone. In this case, you know, there's now literal monsters out there. Why would you be by yourself? It doesn't matter if the android says that this is a safe place to be. Clearly not, because right outside, there are a whole bunch of people, basically the entire humanoid population that is essentially frozen in time, fried for eternity, but yet you think it's safe here. Yeah, she gets killed. It's interesting because the thing doesn't kill her until it sees her reach for her weapon. It sucks that it goes right for the neck. Tennessee reaches the expedition team. It turns out that David has formed a bond with the aliens. And I'm guessing they do this only because they know he's not a living thing, which means these creatures can smell or hear his inner workings. As far as they know, he's a talking tree. The way it stands up though is one of the most haunting things I have ever seen. Like, look what it stands to its full height. Like something out of the freaking Hellraiser series or Resident Evil or something. Just puts me in mind of that. What was the thing with, uh, there's a movie my mom used to watch and she loved it. And I was really little at the time. I can't remember, but they had these nurses that had chattering teeth and no eyes. It kind of reminds me of that. The hill have eyes, maybe. House on Haunting Hill. I don't know. Maybe it was Hellraiser. He communicates with the alien until Orem kills it. You have to earn its respect. No! <laughs> Funny, the alien must have known he was there, but it trusted David. And so it wasn't going to kill one of his friends, even though it was right behind him. It's also aware that David's talking to whatever this thing is. Also, you got to understand it from the stupid human's point of view. He just saw this thing eating one of his crewmates and David is talking to it all sucky sucky like. The captain is able to kill the creature quite easily. You see, the fact that David was that broken up about the alien dying as an android means that if he actually loved Shaw, who he claimed died on the crash after the mysterious pathogen was mysteriously detonated by accident, he must have been pretty broken up about that too. It's so funny when David is like, it trusted me and Oru sees the girl's head floating in the water. And I don't really understand what he means by what he says next but this is the first time he actually takes some assertion and takes charge but don't worry it doesn't last for very long david you're gonna tell me exactly what's going on or i am going to seriously fuck up your perfect composure that part for me was so hilarious not like the ha 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 side splitting laughter need a glass of milk type of thing but like the oh snap that was an actually good line even though it had nothing to do with what he previously said before it as you wish, Captain. This way. You see, you see that thing, right? That doesn't make me trust him. David shows him all his doodads and that he'd been experimenting on these creatures, producing life. David can't have kids, so this is his way of his legacy going on. Imagine living forever, you're not able to create anything. David carries him down to a deep, dark lair and says, look, these are part of my creation's eggs waiting for something. And this idiot, the world's or universe's worst, most stupid person in the entirety of this movie, knowing that David was just making much about a creature that had been feeding on one of the crew members, knowing that David didn't even say anything about that, treated it like a pet, he is going to go and believe David when he says it's perfectly safe to touch an alien egg, to have it open, and to stick your face inside of it very close without a helmet. Not like the helmet would do anything, but still very stupid. You don't know what this is. What if its juices fly out by accident and go in your mouth? But it's okay because natural selection has a way of canceling things out and this guy gets face hug. As the others look for the captain, he gets chest bursted. The little baby Xenomorph pops out like he's cold. He's like, oh my God, daddy, worship me. Let us raise our hands together. This is where Walter finds Elizabeth Shaw's body. She's not actually buried in the grave. David had been working on her, presumably trying to bring her back to life or keep her alive or make some experiment. David gives Walter the kiss of death and I don't know why they had to show it like that. It looks so stupid and disturbing. Gross. It's the way his face looked and then his legs folded up under him before he hit the ground. I don't know. A few of the crew interact with these face huggy things. So one guy gets the face hugger sort of on him for like a quick second and he's able to talk while it's on his face. So there's hope that they can get it off and him not be affected. However, as a result of them cutting it off, the acid ends up burning the poor man's face. 
I also noticed that when he threw it away, it curls up. Stabbing the flaps of those things should not kill it. But yet, it is dead, which is pretty sus. Because if you know the alien universe, those facehuggers only die without severe injury if they've already done their job, which is to lay an egg inside of your stomach, poor guy. Unfortunately, the guy who is saving him ends up getting shafted by the now large and fully grown porter pr pr proto Daniels finds out what happened to Elizabeth Shaw and that David is responsible. This part, when she's about to kill him, or at least aim her gun towards him, is really cool because we see how quick he actually is and it makes me wonder how many takes it took for them to get this shot. Quite the little busybody. Remind me, what is that about? <laughs> Curiosity in the cat. Wicked. <laughs> It's kind of terrifying. She didn't have time, bro. That was freaking awesome. He didn't miss a beat. He still kept his measured tone as he was talking to her. Credit where it's due. Say what you want about this movie, but oh man, he does a great job at being an android. Look at that cute face. So then Daniels puts it together and she's like, Shaw didn't die in the crash. What did you do to her? And the haunting reply he gives her is, Exactly what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> Dude, if he had that power all along, why didn't he use it on the people that he was in close proximity with before? Now I get it, he has to feed his babies and all that. Time to feed my babies. They've never seen this nail. <laughs> so like, she stabs him with the nail and he's like, there's the spirit. Man, I love David. David is amazing. He's such a good villain. Holy crap. And I will say the only person I feel bad for here is Daniels because she's the only character in this entire movie with a drop in an iota of sense. David manhandles her and straddles her and he seems to be getting all hot and bothered and he's like, I can see why Walter thought so much of you. Oh my. Somewhere in this entire scene is a gigantic opportunity for fan fiction, which by the way, I have found. And yes, by the way, I'm not the only one who had that tra train of thought. Yes, I know, girls are weird. You know, I, I hate how people think it's guys are the only ones who are like looking at things and like, can we fuck it? No, nope, no, girls wonder that too. Except is, uh, can it do me? As long as there's a possibility for something, you can write the fan fiction around it. Except for the girls, it's more of the idea and the story and for the guys, it's visual. So every time a girl tells you guys that your men are dogs, just retort with, thank you, women are bitches. But in all seriousness, they pretty much set this whole thing up for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> the way that the scroll fell off the scroll was like okay i'm gonna head out right now <laughs> man i love this movie so he asks her is that how it's done but he doesn't have time to even contemplate or wait for an answer because out of the blue comes the real boyfriend walter and yeets him away he's like get the hell away from my girl he doesn't actually say that but that's basically what he does so of course the two start fighting just like you expected because of course you can't have two characters who look exactly like each other and not have them fight so people can be confused and not know which one's which even with one hand walter is obviously much stronger than david he tells shaw sorry he tells daniels to get out which is to give her enough time to escape after all she and the other crew members call down tennessee and asked them to pick them up. David is more than shocked, wondering how Walter is still alive. Walter is like, hm, I told you. We've had many updates since your kind. And it's awesome because it's only been 10 years since David and Elizabeth have been away from Earth. So it's a testament to how far technology has come, I guess. You're meant to be dead. There have been a few updates since your day. That's kind of wicked. He should have won. So as Walter is beating him to a pulp, he stops to hear him talk, giving David enough time to ask him to choose between him or the humans while he reaches for his freaking knife. That alone convinces me that Walter does have some semblance of awareness or humanism, hum humanity, because he would have just gotten rid of the threat immediately. Instead, he stops momentarily because he doesn't want to kill a member of his own kind. Completely logical being, like an android, who is void of any emotion like Walter said, would have not even let this guy finish talking. But yes, they cut away after we see that Walter is about to deal a crushing blow, which lets us know, very obviously, there's no reason to do that whole bait and switch thing, that David is going to come out there looking like Walter. How he was able to get the hairstyle right and everything, because their hair was slightly different from the last time we saw them, 
them is completely beyond me. Did he have time to color his hair and shape it up exactly the way that he saw Walter wearing his hair? In the space of what? Only a few minutes? Where'd you get the coloring from? Do you have dry coloring to do that? Because your hair is bone dry. Usually after you color your hair or apply color to it, it's wet. So unless there's something here we don't know about, unless androids have the ability to just change their hair color whenever they need to, this makes no sense. They set up a beacon and Tennessee comes to get them with this flatbed thing. An alien sees them heading towards it and he's like, don't leave me guys, I want to come with you too. I will say the alien design is very beautiful and Covenant is the first time we actually get to see the alien in all its glory and beauty running and moving around with actually good CGI and movement. They manage to take off, but the protomorph is attached to the vehicle. Daniels uses the crane to capture the creature who attacks it thinking it's another creature, which is another continuity error because I know this is a different type of xenomorph than the other one, but don't they have the ability to know what's an android and what is not, especially from like far away? Shouldn't this creature, like all the other creatures, just know that that crane or lift tractor thing is not a living thing? Wouldn't it go for the living thing that's right beside it? How convenient for the plot that the aliens don't attack robots who, I don't know, look like humans, talk like them, and walk like them, but they attack objects that don't look like their hosts. The android has actual fluid running through it and more lifelike movements. Now, understandably, if I saw this thing with big jaws coming after me, I would think that it's a big creature being a biological creature, but xenomorphs are supposed to be highly evolved, the perfect creatures and whatnot. So how is it that it can't smell that this thing is not alive, but it can smell that Walter's not alive? I mean, David. You know what I'm saying? Like, this movie, I love it to pieces, but good grief is it convenient when it needs to be. This part where Daniel was just flying off and is held on by the rope that she's attached to just skis me out because it's like a freaking spider. I don't know why that, ugh, just, it's like that one time I was trying to befriend a jumping spider and then it leaps towards me and just hangs on with its freaking butt rope and I'm like god gr no no can't be doing that give me a heart attack like that that's not right you're gonna like make yourself into a freaking wrecking ball and send me to my grave early why do they do that or when you're looking at them they just freaking do that that's annoying you were looking at a spider on a wall and then it just falls and then you lose your shit. Then it gets lost and you can't find it. This is why I like big spiders like tarantulas. The biggest, the bigger and furrier they are, the more I like them. Oh my god! Oh my god! Not those ones, not those ones, the tarantulas. Specifically the tarantulas, I think they're the only kinds. Cause they're fat, you know, they're as wide as they are long. If they're furry and then long on top of it and they have like freaking venom, no thanks. I mean, it helps that they can't get lost in your clothes, oh God. But seriously, look at this spider and look at this spider. The one on the left is a tarantula, it's so much more cute. Look how cute it's fuzzy and cute and small. It looks like the circle. The other one looks like forks and knives all blended together. That's why they freak me out. There's your answer. Daniels is fighting for her life trying to avoid this thing. And she takes the opportunity and crushes the xenomorph inside the crane, sending the acid blood spraying everywhere. How is it that she has no acid blood on her? A drop of this thing can go through your clothes and severely hurt you. Yet she's unscathed. Xenomorph falls to pieces and all is well. Tennessee and the other girl put the guy with the cheek to sleep to help his wounds. While Daniels thanks Walter for saving her life again. But we all know this is David because they're focusing on him so much that even if you had no idea it was, they would start to make you suspicious around this point. But just to make sure because she's feeling suspicious too, she looks down at his arm because she remembers that Walter lost his arm to save her. Look at the crew. Look how many people were killed for no reason. Who in the hell was that. Do you remember seeing this guy in the crew? Don't remember seeing him. They think everything's okay and when the ship wakes them up, there's something wrong in the med bay. A life form. Yep, that man that had the face hugger on him for like a second, it somehow got the egg inside of him while he was still able to talk. Did it stick it up his ass? I don't know. But usually when those things stick their hoses down your throat, you are choking. You can't speak. So the only time that would have happened is once it went on his face, shoved it down his throat and did it very quickly because he was fighting. It seems as though the process needs a little bit of time, but maybe that face hugger is just a quick splurter. And he was like, stop moving. I only need like half a second. I promise you, I get done super quick. And then it was like, all right, I'm done. Or maybe the act of him trying to get it off made it feel more frisky and then it, you know, Ew. Juice are smaller and his wife are killed. Don't know why the alien was doing all of that. Why it didn't just kill them? But this part is so sweet and honestly so sad because as she sees the alien's teeth, she tries to save her husband and pull him away from the glass. But it's too late. He dies. And so does she. Nice and hot. Hot and spicy meat. 
<laughs> yeah, boy. With who they think is Walter's help, Daniels and Tennessee are the last ones there. They trap the Xenomorph and lead it to the terraforming bay. It's smart enough to attack the cameras, which again makes no sense unless it understands completely what they're for, because you know it's not a living thing. They open the airlock to the terraforming bay, and with Tennessee's help, they try to eat it into space. Such a beautiful shot there. As the protomorph goes to attack Daniels, it is impaled, still again, don't know how she's not hit by the acid that's right above her, and says a terraforming vehicle back to the planet so that thing can die where it is. As they're getting ready to go back to sleep and go to our guy 6, Daniels asks Walter if she'll help him build her cabin. And this is the moment, I mean, we know it's not him, but she doesn't. And this is the moment when she finds out, oh no, you're not Walter. Good God. I think it would have been better if they had played it up so that Walter was actually like really nice to her or the way he was before, instead of making it look all weird. He is helping them. So they thought, oh, the audience won't know because he's helping them to get to be alive. Like, he wouldn't do that. The real David wouldn't do that. David wouldn't do that regardless. He wouldn't need them. So what was even the point? Especially Tennessee. Unless he likes Daniels and he's like, you know what? I want to save her for later. Will you help me build my cabin? The cabin on the lake. This is the moment she realizes, uh, you don't remember the conversation we had? Because you would have. Because you're an android. And that face that you made doesn't make me feel comfortable. <laughs> so he puts her to sleep and he's like i'll tuck in the kids don't worry also don't know why the ship didn't see that something was wrong when he i guess it didn't expect that they were gonna go on some strange journey to some other planet and another rogue android was gonna take over the ship anyways he opens the embryo tank and he starts throwing up all the embryo eggs he has for the xenomorphs which is two to be exact or more rather little face huggers and he's like there you go you're gonna have so much food when we wake up so did he like reprogram himself with the ship he sends out a uh message saying that the colonists are okay but all the crew members are dead except for daniels and tennessee unless it's a running gag for characters to be stupid in these movies which is what they seem to be doing it really is not necessary and like i said in the beginning it would be a lot more scary and terrifying if the characters did something that was smart did everything they possibly could have done to make sure they were safe and then something despite everything that they have done despite all their efforts still ended up killing them that to me is more scary but anyway i still love this movie it was still amazing and in terms of entertainment and it's sci-fi and aliens don't you know and android so can't not love it i think the only reason and i you know i i wondered this for the longest while because somebody asked me and they were like well you know you didn't like jurassic park but you like these stupid alien movies i think the reason why i'm still in love with these alien movies no matter how stupid they are is because it does something that jurassic park failed to do and it's keep the xenomorphs freaking scary no matter which movie they're in no matter how stupid the characters are or how stupid and dumb the movies are, the xenomorphs are always true to form. They are always terrifying. Thank you so much for keeping them so. I swear to God, if in the next movies, they make them into pets and then they want to keep them alive and have them talk to each other, I'm going to lose my shit. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. This has been Ulturi. You ask, we answer.